Hello, I'm Gunther Manson. and I'll be your host uh, for this breakout session. Uh, welcome everyone to the IQAG uh, 21 breakout session for Earth Resources Raw Materials. And in this session, uh, we will show you an overview of IQAG's approach to tackling the raw materials challenge. We will have several speakers and there will be a Q&A at the end. You can use the Q&A button on the right hand panel to ask your question. Um, or type it directly into the session chat, uh, which is also on the right hand panel. If you would like your, to ask your question on stage, please just let us know in your question. Otherwise, we will read it for you. Now, our, our speakers for this session are uh, Dr. Alini Melo, Assistant Professor at UCD, Professor Dave Chu at TCD, uh, Dr. Geertje Schuitema, uh, Associate Professor at UCD, and Dr. Richard Unit from University College Cork. So what is the Earth Resources Challenge ahead? The Irish population is expected to increase by at least 15% by 2040. We need at least half a million homes built and all the infrastructure that goes with this. It's a big challenge. On a global level, we need the raw materials to achieve the goals of COP21 and 26 in order to decarbonize our society and to help uh, achieve and support the UN sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals and the Irish Climate Emergency Action Plan. Uh, ICRAG is also helping to implement EU strategies for sustainable development and to achieve greater resource efficiency and, and by doing that, helping to support the European Green Deal. Um, and within all of this, it is vitally important that we do this through a, a just transition, leaving none behind and uh, certainly protecting the environment. So what is ICRAG doing to address this challenge? ICRAG is addressing this challenge in, in mainly four main ways. Uh, first of all, by securing a uh, sustainable and efficient supply of mineral resources. Secondly, uh, to find the raw materials that we that are critical uh, to enable the energy transition. Within all that, all of that, we need to develop responsible decision making processes and make sure um, that everyone has access to these re uh, earth resources and that we have society with us. And ultimately, we also need safe and sustainable geomaterials closer to home for Ireland's construction industry and the associated transport infrastructure. So you may wonder who in ICRAG is going to do this? Well, as you know, ICRAG uh, is, a, is a laterally thinking community, to use a, a quote I heard yesterday from an industry collaborator, uh, with expertise in, in many domains which are listed on the left. We've been championing over the last uh, several years, uh, collaborative research, uh, either one-on-one -on -one with, with our partners, also uh, in multi-stakeholder projects. And we often provide a framework for uh, large consortia and EU projects. So we're open for business in that regard. And I think personally, some of our most impactful projects are those where our researchers are embedded within industry uh, day to day so that we can get direct impact in projects at business decision timeframes. So our researchers are open uh, for direct engagement. So we, of course, not only have programs in, in Ireland, uh, but we are globally facing uh, increasingly with more than 40 major projects in the last six years uh, in many countries, as Murray uh, showed earlier, uh, with over, last time I counted, 40 industry partners in the raw materials sphere. ICRAG has ongoing projects globally, you know, ranging from Alaska to Greenland to Namibia to the Central African Copper Belt. And uh, I think these last two are, are examples of our focus on Africa, uh, which helps support the EU Africa strategy. Currently, we have a team of 15 faculty members in raw materials and 20 researchers across all the institutions, and we are growing. We also have a dedicated business development team to help projects get online quickly and efficiently, 
with Emer, Aoife and Francesca all having significant industry experience. So please liaise with them. They're there for us. We will now guide you through a series of talks uh, through some of our activities. And I will kick this off by talking about how we are securing an efficient supply of mineral resources. So 21st century mineral exploration and production has to be uh, responsive to its social and environmental context. It has to be profitable to do it. And it is also absolutely required to achieve the 2050 climate uh, goals. The dark blue line in this image from Wood Mackenzie shows the huge increase in the required predicted um, production of lithium, cobalt, and nickel. If we are to achieve uh, goals of less than two degrees global warming through uh, decarbonizing our society, that is two degrees, not one and a half. And so for many metals, we need to almost double our production in the next decade or so. So we need to act now and we need to really think big. So what is ICRAG's value to the minerals industry? Well, first of all, uh, it's the people, uh, as Pat so nicely put uh, in the previous industry um, session. It's the professionals who will be the industry of the future. Um, we also add value to our integrated genetic models for mineral deposits and mineral districts by integrating tectonal stratigraphy, geophysical and geochemical research uh, just under one roof. In addition, we improve and develop exploration methods in geochemistry, mineralogy, geophysics, including seismics, machine learning, and so on. And uh, through understanding uh, metal deportment, we can help with the production and recycling. And we are also developing uh, new geochemical and thermal vectoring methodologies and applying them uh, in case studies with our partners. So just to give you one example of close to home of how ICRAG research helped in this case, uh, Group 11 resources um, in, in their discovery of minerals uh, in recent targeting exercises in County Limerick. So let's go into some uh, projects, current and research and recent projects. ICRAG has projects that um, I think range from fully open source on the one end to confidential. And of course, I will show some examples of recent and ongoing work from the Irish zinc-led ore field that I can show. Um, this slide shows you work by uh, Dr. Steve Hollis and colleagues, which was funded by the Geological Survey Ireland, where they used high precision lead isotopes on Galena across the Irish ore field. And this work shows clear systematic variations in lead isotopes that are linked to different metallogenic basement uh, source regions. And at the prospect scale using that same data set, because the analysis are so precise, uh, we can for the first time see subtle scale isotopic variations, small scale variations along metal bearing trends. This is, for example, the Rath Downey trend, where there's a systematic trend. And you can also see this between different ore bodies at Navan, for example. This helps us better understand fluid flow, mineralization, and alteration processes. One other aspect at the prospect and target scale uh, is recent work by Oakley Turner and Aileen Doran uh, on pyrites. They've quantified how the deportment of trace elements varied through different pyrogenetic phases through time, with, for example, th uh, thallium, arsenic, cobalt, and nickel all decreasing systematically away from mineralized areas and also waxing and waning through the pyrogenetic sequences. We are now taking this a step further going forward with, for example, the work, ongoing work of Lingli Zhao and Claire Giel, who are characterizing trace elements in pyrite that is distal, further away from deposits. This will allow us to fully uh, encompass the distal to proximal systems and also early to late phases with the aim, of course, of getting more out of exploration drilling, which is expensive. We can also build, as Murray highlighted before, on the work done by Tyke Dornan 
on the fingerprinting of pyrite to identify quarry sources. And uh, the new neural network classification methods that TIG developed are clearly able to distinguish, and this is just an image from, uh, from its work, uh, distinguish different sources using the trace elements in pyrite. And this method will be applied to the full Irish zinc lead or field data sets for mineral exploration. Uh, as many of you know that know, ICRAC has, has many analy analytical facilities, including for trace element vectoring and rhenium osmin dating, to just name some. You can see a list there. We're open for bespoke industry work and also for knowledge, knowledge exchange, either as collaborative projects or uh, more short-term consultancy work. Not only that, but also ICRAC's computation and visualization uh, suite uh, combines, for example, seismic interpretation over resource and geophysical modeling to, to digital outcrop studies and machine learning. And the real advantage, advantage, in my opinion, is that we have all the cutting edge solutions that are available in one place under one roof. And so we can provide knowledge exchange and uh, the best ways forward uh, for industry relevant problems in, in that regard. So one way we, we do that is, uh, that was highlighted before, is through our integrated deposit scale and regional 3D, three-dimensional modeling. Uh, this supports not just the raw materials, I want to highlight this, that we look across the fence, but also the groundwater and geothermal sector uh, in particular. So just one example of the Irish zinc lead uh, ore field is a true and an across the fence approach, I would say. We now have three three-dimensional structure and stratigraphic models of onshore Ireland, such as, for example, Southeast Ireland, shown here. And we also have detailed uh, ore deposit models and resource models, such as the uh, by now well-known uh, Lachine example here. And so using depth to target models, for example, of the base of all sortion, we can then provide the context for intermediate modeling. Uh, here, an example of a modeling, 3D modeling of the intensity and extent of hydrothermal breaches, black matrix breaches, um, which is a hydrothermal alteration around deposits done by Nick Vafias. And this provides us better quantitative understanding of how far these hydrothermal uh, halos extend uh, in uh, around deposits and prospects in more detail. So we have several ongoing single and multi-stakeholder projects globally. Uh, which I didn't, don't show here, um, and they range from the mine to regional scale. And the last example uh, I want to show uh, before I hand it over is our work on integrated lithological characterization and correlation. And we do this using isotopic uh, techniques, petrophysical techniques, and litho lithophasis mapping. And um, many of you will, will have been somehow exposed to parts of this work where we are trying to transform uh, are constraints on uh, facies distributions in the Trinasian and Visean of Ireland through a, a whole Ireland uh, approach looking at boreholes, which will be an open access, um, updatable living document. Um, it is expert driven, driven um, and designed for, for the minerals industry in particular in this case, but also useful for geothermal and groundwater. And so the real strength here, I think, in uh, what has affectionately become to known as the Blue Book 2, uh, is that we work and bring together expertise across the geoscience sector in Ireland with consultancies, many industry partners, and the geological survey. And so we are doing similar projects as well, notably, for example, in the Central African Copper Belt. Um, so what I will now do is hand over uh, to my colleague Alini Melo, and she will talk about uh, big data approaches and geophysical research that ICRAG is doing. So, Alina, the stage is yours if you would like to uh, join the stage. Hi, Cohen. Thank you so much. Um, I will share my screen. Um, yeah, great. Um, so good to be here today and share uh, with you some some of the ideas of 
what has been done and the 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 road abreast, uh, the the road ahead uh, for us. So as we advance our understanding of the geology by analyzing and interpreting drilling data, as just shown by Cohen, we also need to think about methods for transferring this knowledge to areas with less hard data using low footprint methods to, Im to image the earth. So, um, slide, okay, yeah. So, interpreting uh, rock core data allow us to keep shifting the interpretation space from 2D to 3D to model the stratigraphy and faults. Um, however, the drill holes are limited to specific areas and shallower parts. So for this reason, we use geophysics to image the subsurface in areas that lack drilling constraints. And um, we want to see deeper. So by applying um, techniques to image the earth in 3D, thinking about how the system evolve with time. So here, here we, we need to actually shift our interp interpretation space to 3D and also think about the fourth dimension. How does the system evolve with time? So for constructing these models, we do the inverse path as we use the measured fields to model physical properties and interpret the geology. So one of the past projects in this framework developed by Dias focused on constructing 3D electrical uh, conductivity and velocity models for Ireland's crust as controls for the systems because they are often missing um, this deeper imaging, uh, let's say more than two kilometers. And it's, it's, this type of imaging is very important for actually finding big feeders and understanding how the crust like uh, contributed to the mineral deposits we have in Ireland. So this result showed uh, main, uh, signif significant variations um, in the middle to deep crust. The imaging of velocity of the crust was done uh, using industrial quarry blasts as seismic sources, aiming to identify feeders and uh, roots of uh, deep geothermal systems. So the results here show that the blue regions are colder or more mafic, and the red regions are warmer or less mafic. This other project by Dias uh, focused on integration uh, by developing a multi-physics joint inversion framework of magnetotelluric, seismic, and gravity data. So an imaging technique that actually take the most uh, of all data types to construct models that have um, sharper edge, edges and can image the geology better and actually uh, give more insight for better interpretations. So the next step of this research is going to be applied this technique to data uh, across Ireland. These projects developed by Dias were done with the support of GSI and Geothermica. And um, we will con continue to work on methods to improve imaging the subsurface to make better predictions. And I am now going to briefly talk about one of the new projects in ICRAD2, which will be focused on deposit scale imaging as we go through the inverse path um, to construct the physical property models. Petrophysical data is a key element to help constructing better models. So for this reason, we will start a project focused on integrating petrophysical data into the modeling framework. Um, and actually data from rocks uh, from, from Ireland, in, uh, in situ and specific to the areas being modeled. And the project will analyze historical data and acquire new data in the lab that we are starting um, in UCD. The focus will be on finding the correspondence of or the patterns between the non-geological units and the 3D geophysical models, guided by physical property measurements of rocks, as I said before, in situ. So we plan to construct a common earth models 
that will help us gain, in, gain uh, insight of the geophysical behavior of the rocks and transfer to areas with little and no drilling using machine learning techniques. This project has a strong link with the energy challenge as we will be using similar techniques which have already uh, shown good outcomes as demonstrated by the discovery of Tara Deep as we want to start defining the physical property signatures of the rocks for the Carboniferous geological setting. We want to define the geophysical signature of the deposits, host rocks, and alteration halos as well. So we want to gain understanding of all the variations that happen at depth and how all this information can be used to make new discoveries. Those techniques are going to be developed and tested in Ireland, but the methodologies can, apply, can be applied in a variety of geological settings in different places in the world. So the industry partners for this petrophysic project that have uh, agreed to support this research um, are listed in this slide. So thank you very much for, for all the, the support. And this is just a brief overview of what has been done and, what's we are, and what we are planning to do for ICRAG2. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions in the Q&A session or through the chat. So I can hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Oh, is it me, Kieran? It was you. <laughs> it was ahead. me. Sorry, I, was, I wasn't. I wasn't introduced, so I couldn't no remember. If it was me or not? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. If not, someone please tell me. So my name is David Chu, and I'm going to be talking to you about raw materials to enable the energy transition. And this presentation is also uh, co-authored by Ling Li Zhu in UCD. So I'm sure all of you are very, very aware of the COP26 uh, climate summit that took place in Glasgow uh, in November. And the very first goal of COP26 was to secure global net zero by mid-century and keep 1.5 degrees warming within reach. And four key deliverables were outlined in COP26 to achieve goal one. And these were accelerating the phase out of coal, curtailing deforestation, speeding up the switch to electric vehicles and encouraging investment in renewables. And several of these deliver deliverables are intimately associated with critical metals. So what is a critical metal? A critical metal is a metal of economic importance that may be subject to future scarcity. And in the, this diagram here, prepared by the European Commission last year, going up the screen towards the bright red colors are metals that are, of, that are deemed of high criticality. And in particular, for example, both the light and heavy rare earth elements are deemed very, very high criticality because they're used in magnets, for example, in wind turbines and in motors. And then, for example, things like uh, batteries or cobalt is, is a key component of them and so on. So critical metals are important, very, very important for this transition to a, to a net zero economy. However, when it comes to exploring for critical metals, one of the key problems is that most critical metals are actually present in the Earth's crust at relatively low concentrations. And even when inside a more, an ore phase, they're not found in concentrations that are high enough to warrant extraction as a primary product at today's prices. So commonly, as a generality, many critical metals are obtained primarily as byproducts when refining primary ores, be it copper, zinc, 
lead or whatever. So for example, tellurium is common, commonly found in copper ores. Indium, for example, is commonly found in zinc ores. So, so we've got a, a component of byproduct dependency. So in iCRAG 1, we developed several tools for trying to determine the deportments of these critical metals, which are often present at very, very low concentrations, sometimes even at the part per million level in ores. And this included laser-based ablation ICPMS trace element mapping, such as this example on the screen of a, of a, of a deep sea uh, manganiferous nodule, where we're looking at the rare earth element contents of it. And we developed these data software tools or reduction of approaches where we can extract data from laser ablation maps or SEM maps to work out the, the concentrations of critical metals in ore phases. And in ICRAG 1, we were starting to apply the tools, such as this work by Bettini uh, Dracu in uh, the Caribou Mine in the Bathurst VMS in New Brunswick in Canada. And she discovered things, for example, that often things like gold and tinamine in lead zinc ore were hosted in primary pyrite. And this means they're never going to be recoverable in a smelter or not very easily recoverable. But she, when she looked at things like zinc ores, here's a zinc map from the same rocks. She could type, this is primary sphalerite. And if I overlay the Indian map, which I shall do now, you can ex effectively see that there's almost a one-for-one -one correspondence between uh, Indian and zinc in the primary sphalerite ore. And this has got potential for recovery in the smelter. So these are many of the laser ablation approaches that iCRAG-1 developed. It was also uh, mentioned by Kuhn in, the, in uh, his presentation, where he was mentioning that uh, various iCRAG use, uh, researchers are using geochemical vectoring and using trace elements and pyrites in the Irish lead zinc ore field. Same techniques, different application. Then moving into iCRAG2, Ling Li Zhu, who is a researcher in UCD, while she was a GSI funded postdoc, she was investigating critical metals in the Irish lead zinc ore field. She was looking at sphalerites in the Irish lead zinc deposits and noticed that, for example, some of them contain appreciable germanium, particularly in Abbeytown, Ballinalak, silver mines, whereas they're quite low in gallium and very depleted in indium. She was also investigating uh, in the Tina tailings, where these critical metals, germanium, gallium, and indium, are selectively deported, both in various mineral phases and also biogenic zinc and various other zinc and, uh, and uh, iron carbonates and so on. And this is going to be important research going in to ICRAG2. Another ICRAG2 affiliated project is that of Julian Manouge. This is a project looking at energy critical elements in the Irish pegmatites. And the work of Julian and his group has shown, for example, looking in Leinster in the, in the lithium cesium tantalum bearing pegmatites, these are spodumene bearing pegmatites, that the, they are effectively the distribution of these elements is controlled by the magmatic to hydrothermal transition in these pegmatites. And the hydrothermal alteration enhances tantalum but partially destroys the lithium potential. And this is a big EU project. Uh, this Green Peg project will be looking at not only the spodumene pe pegmatites in Leinster, but also similar pegmatites in Austria and also high purity quartz uh, pegmatites in Norway. And a big component of ICRAG2 uh, critical metal research is looking at co cobalt in the central African copper belt. So sedimentary copper deposits are a major source of copper and, uh, and silver worldwide. They occur in rocks from all the way from the Paleoproterozoic to the recent. However, the Central African Copper Belt is the only district that contains or produces significant cobalt, and it represents about 60% of global cobalt production currently. So here's a graph of annual cobalt production. You can see the the global trend in grey and how the, the DRC trend more or less mimics this because it's supplying such a, a large amount of global cobalt production. And this is a big ICRAG2 research group comprising several faculty members, research associates, five postdocs and two PhD students. 
So if we look at the cobalt and the, the ICRAG-2 research in cobalt in the Central African Copper Belt, we can see that some of the provinces are not particularly prospective for cobalt. These are provinces where the cobalt is held either in cobaltite or cobalt-bearing pyrite. But the main cobalt-bearing ore is carolite. And we see this both in the Congo Copper Belt and the Zambian Copper Belt. And ICRAG-2 researchers have working, been working on the paragenesis of these cobalt bearing phases, where carolite is, uh, grows with copper minerals. And this research is key for working out the prospectivity and the deportment of cobalt in these deposits. And ICRAG-2 researchers have discovered that there's a paragenetic sequence where framboidal pyrite, which is low in cobalt, goes to cobalt bearing pyrite, and then to shalfa pyrite and copper cobalt sulfide, such as carolite. And trace element mapping by SEM and laser ablation shows that there is multiple generations of carolites, e carolite, each with its own distinctive trace element signature. And they've shown also that the cobalt bearing pyrite is associated with magnesium alteration to magnesite, whereas the carolite is associated with the magnesite and silica. And this information is key for working out the prospectivity of these deposits. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Kirtia, and she's going to discuss, discuss the social accessibility of critical methods. Thank you very much, Dave. Let me share my screen. So as Dave just so very nicely introduced, it is absolutely essential for the um, um, energy transition to have sufficient supply of, of uh, raw metals. Um, but it's not just a matter of technically being able to access and to detect these metals. It's also absolutely critical that we have social access to these critical metals. So my background, my name is Geertje Schoutema. My background is in psychology. I'm currently working in the College of Business as an associate professor. And what I want to do is spend the next uh, few minutes talking about a research project that we hope to conduct in ICRAC2 to address and, and look at social accessibility of these critical raw metals. Just to highlight, and this is not an uncommon uh, scene, I think, in a lot of countries. Um, social accessibility is very much related to the acceptance of um, the mining industry, the extraction industry. And um, what you very often see is local communities objecting to um, a new project taking place. And this is what we refer to as social license to operate. It also came back in, in the panel session we earlier heard. A social license to operate refers to the um, local community's acceptance or local stakeholder acceptance of a mining operation um, taking place. However, what we think is we need to look beyond social license to operate. Social license to operate is extremely important, but it's also important that there's a wide societal support for mining activities as part of the energy transition. So what we want to do in this project is look at a much wider social acceptance and move beyond just local community acceptance of the mining um, industry. And just to illustrate why this is important, we, we had a very um, uh, quick uh, association task with the word mining. We asked Irish citizens to, to write down the first three words they thought of when they thought of mining. And this word cloud shows you the, um, um, the results of that. And what you see is dangerous is the biggest word in this word cloud. There's also more negative words that you see like dirty, um, raw, which I would interpret as slightly negative, unhealthy, uh, pollution. And there's very few extremely positive words with mining. And I show you this because I think it illustrates very well that the entire mining industry seems to have a general negative reputation and there's a lot of negative associations with the industry. 
Now, that's not very much a surprise if you look at the news and if you look at the media. To, just to give you some examples, um, just last week, um, over 50 miners were killed in Russia um, due to an accident in, in a mine. And as I'm sure everybody's very aware of, of fairly recent um, issues with Rio Tinto um, and, and, uh, and the um, um, problems with indigenous sites in Australia. And only last week, Murray was on the television on BBC's Panorama, which was a program to, um, to highlight the negative impact of cobalt industry um, for the batteries needed for electric vehicles. So if you look at the media, they very much stress these negative associations that already exist in society. Now, what might you do to change this? Well, on the one hand, you can try to reduce these negative associations. You can, and, and there's a lot of work done in the mining industry to improve their reputation. Think about um, ethical resourcing, ethical mining uh, operations. But what we want to do in this project is not just look at these negative associations, but have a look and see if we can build more positive associations um, but with, for the mining industry. Now, and what we propose to do is make this link that Dave so nicely explained between the low carbon society and energy transition and the need for critical raw metals. So this association is very unknown in the wider public. A lot of people would never think about the need for critical raw metals if they want to achieve a low carbon society. And there's fairly strong support for a low carbon society. So what we propose to do in this project is work on these positive associations instead of trying to focus on the negative ones. How do we want to do this? Well, if you look at current scenarios of the energy transition, there's very often only a linkage with CO2 emissions. So the different components needed um, to transition to a more sustainable energy system looks upwards towards CO2 emissions. But in these scenarios, you very rarely see the need for critical raw materials. So a link back to the supply chain. So what do we aim to do in this research? We aim to build a simulator in which um, consumers, uh, stakeholders, um, school children will be able to, to balance out the different consequences of the need for critical raw metals for an energy transition. So for example, if you want X amount of wind energy, how many um, uh, specifically raw metals do you need for that? And what are the consequences in terms of mining? But you can also think about scenarios, where would you want to mine these resources? Is that um, done within Europe or outside of Europe? Now, critical of this is that you always have to make a trade-off. What do you find most important if you want to build your ideal scenarios? And to understand what people find most important when thinking about these trade-offs, we are interested to understand which values underlie the choices they make. So what is most important to them when they're considering the consequences of building these scenarios and making these linkages? So that's the plan we have or a proposed project we really hope to do in ICRAC too. Now, this is just to highlight a research project that falls within one of the three challenges um, in ICRAC, and that's the Earth Science and Society Challenge. And this is a research challenge that focuses on the social accessibility of um, critical raw metals, but we also um, have research to support responsible decision making, understanding social challenges of geoengineering projects, enhancing stakeholder engagement and look at building more resilient communities to geohazards. What we've done is in each of these breakout groups, there are social scientists talking um, on these topics. So we made sure that in each of these breakout groups, earth science in society is well represented and, and showcasing the work they're planning to do. So just to finish, 
the sort of, um, Marie already mentioned it in his talk, um, Niall McCormack also mentioned it in the panel session. I just want to stress that we are organizing uh, as part of this challenge, um, a second Restore Summer School, which is a summer school where we really try to bring young academics and young professional careers together to discuss issues and challenges on the nexus of geosciences and social sciences. Now, if you're interested in participating, the call is open. If you're interested in sponsoring us, there's also information on our website. And I uh, put down our email address, so please be in touch if you've got any questions. So that is what I had to share with you today. I am delighted to hand over to Richard Unit, who is in UCC. Richard, if you could join the stage. Perfect. Thank you, Hitcher. Um, yeah, I'm just going to get that up there. What I'm going to talk about, um, uh, we're going to move away from the metals. Uh, we're going towards uh, safe and sustainable geomaterials for Ireland's construction industry and transport infrastructure. Uh, I put this together with the help of Dr. Robbie Goodhue in uh, Trinity. Um, who is uh, the other major researcher working on these topics? Richard, just want to make yeah. sure if you're sharing your slides. Please. There's something gone wrong there, folks. It's it's the button next to the microphone on the bottom. Um, that you need to click to the right of it, and then you can share your slide. Let me go out to come out again now. I've got. I'm sure. Oh, there we go. Is that working now, folks? Let me share it for you. No, I've got it. I've got it here. Kuhn, has that worked? Go on. Yeah. Is that up? Yeah. All good. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I'll just go on to this now. So geomaterials, um, basically geological materials, uh, especially stone aggregates. And they are a major constituent of a lot of the products that we use in building construction and our transport infrastructure. And what we do at ICRAG is we try and characterize these materials to try and understand both their positive and negative effects on their different end products. Now, just to say that this, uh, this topic kind of fits in with um, the Project Ireland 2040, where the first two national strategic outcomes are for compact growth and enhanced region accessibility. So um, the work we're doing funnels in to, to these strategic outcomes. So what are the positive effects? Well, uh, we had project in ICRAG 1, and Murray touched on that earlier, uh, concerning skid resistance on our road surfaces. But we're also concerned about how sustainable are our roads, how durable are our roads, how sustainable and durable are our building products. Other things we could be looking at, the ability to recycle certain products. So we're involved with a project at the moment to look at what's called their wrap which is recycled or reclaimed asphalt products. Um, and uh, that's something we haven't start, quite started yet, but we're moving into. Now, uh, I've put there also repurposing of fine grain waste material. Um, by classifying every material that's produced in, the, in an extraction industry, some of this material, especially the fine grain stuff, has often been uh, classified as a waste. Um, so some of the projects we could be looking at is once we have classified all the materials, including the fine grain materials, we could find innovative ways of including those back into new building materials. The negative effects. I think we all uh, know by now about the negative effects of uh, our, uh, construction uh, materials. So we've got our deleterious effects. These are things like our pyrite and mica. So on the right hand side, you've got the classic sort of uh, mica where you've got expansion of blocks due to freeze thaw action. Um, we've got uh, in the middle there, we've got heave uh, from the foundations caused by pyrite in uh, the subfloor aggregates. And on the left here, we have um, what's known as raveling. So it's basically breaking up of, of a road surface. And that's a, pr a project that we're moving on with in ICRAG2, where we're looking at the relationship between the stone aggregate and the materials that bind them together. If we can understand that better, then we can design our road surfaces much better uh, so that they would have a, a, a much better life cycle. Um, just talking about uh, 
researchers, partners, collaborators. There's a, there's a list of, of, of people there. Uh, Murray showed you that um, 3D topographic model that was um, used in a publication uh, that myself and Pat Meir uh, out of UCC um, uh, published back in 2018. So that's associated with the NICRAG-1 um, project. In the middle here, we have something that uh, Robert Goodhue did with Leona O'Connor. So this goes back to the, the mica in the uh, concrete blocks. And this was looking at a way, uh, trying to find a method to see how much of this these fine micas were actually present in the concrete blocks. Um, the third thing I've put on there is uh, we do uh, collaborate um, with people, market leaders like Renishaw. I've been collaborating with them on uh, developing new applications within the uh, geosciences. So where do we do all this? Um, we've got two uh, um, major uh, labs that we, we work with. We've got the Mary Ward Lab in uh, UCC and the Earth Surface Research Lab in Trinity. Um, the sort of things we can actually do with this equipment is a lot of imaging um, that goes on. Uh, the top left model there is a three-dimensional hyperspectral map. This is basically showing that 3D surface at the top of a road aggregate, um, but this time it's got the mineralogical information superimposed on it. So we can actually see what makes the, uh, in the topography terms, the peaks and the valleys and so we know which minerals are necessary in contact with, with tires as they move over the surface. We can also do high resolution mineral maps. You've seen some of those uh, that Dave showed you earlier, but uh, in the bottom left, there is a, um, a little uh, puck of, of aggregate material. And what's identified in the different colors are different sulfur rich minerals. And this goes into something that we're looking at at the moment, which is we're trying to estimate the degree of reactivity of pyrite in certain aggregates. This goes back to the pyrite problem, but we're also looking at it in terms of roads and also in terms of something that we're looking into, which is the total resource management, being able to use every single material, whether it has deleterious products or not, where can we actually use it and what mitigation measures could we put in place? The uh, final image there is um, a very, very um, sort of detailed um, hyperspectral map, again, using um, Raman spectroscopy of uh, pyrite crystals. These are only a couple of microns across. And we're using that to try and look at the areas where the molecular bonds are weaker. And therefore, these are the areas where um, the initial breakdown of the pyrite takes place. The only thing I, I didn't touch on them, and, and it sort of comes back to, to the concrete blocks and the sort of things that um, Robbie is doing in UCD, which is freeze thaw experiments. So we're looking at how climate can affect the different um, building products. Um, and I think we need to look at climate related product design. Uh, Maria McNutt in her uh, keynote speech talked about the climate across Ireland, but we have lots and lots of microclimates and we probably need to be thinking about designing materials to each specific microclimate um, so that it can cope with the weather as it's changing with the changing climate, but also the current weather conditions that we have at the moment. And I think um, going back to the mica problem there, you see it's happening on the west coast of Ireland where we got, uh, get a lot of driving rain and then we're also getting freeze thaw cycles. Now, the main output of uh, what we actually do, um, these go into the uh, uh, standards. So we're looking to um, amend and develop new standards uh, so there are safe and sustainable practices um, and materials that can be utilized in the future. And there's just a list of some of the, um, the standards uh, that we are either working with now or we have worked with in the past. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Richard, and all the speakers of the se of the session. Uh, can I just ask everyone who spoke uh, here to come on stage so we can uh, go through uh, some questions uh, from the audience? I don't see that many questions. We have a few, 
uh, that were asked uh, also in private. Um, so please just, you know, fire away in the chat box on the right and we'll, we'll do our best to go through them. Um, and then we don't have that much time. Um, so I guess one, one question that was asked was about um, regulations for data formats for incorporation into national databases for the mining and mineral exploration industry. And it was partly answered. What I want to add here is that, for example, the Geological Survey and ICRAG have been collaborating on a national drill hole database. We've inputted uh, a, a big proportion of, of data to that, of publicly available data, and are working with them uh, on that. So I think um, not only in Ireland, but that's something that will uh, definitely come uh, for other areas. Um, one question uh, that we got for, for Alina is, you know, on the, the petrophysics project that you presented, what, what are the, the, the areas that that project will be focusing on? In this early stage, we will be focusing in one area in Limerick region and the other area will be in the Midlands, um, probably east of Navan. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question here from, from Murray himself asking, I, ICRAG is focused on Irish materials, mineral materials, but how much um, of it of ICRAG is working outside the country, both in, in metals and in, in building materials? Maybe I can pass that on to, to Dave to give it a first try. Can I say that again, Kuhn? So Sorry. how, how much can... of our work is not just in Ireland in terms of the minerals and metals, but, but outside the country? Okay, well, there's obviously, there's a very, very big research projects on the Central African copper belts, but ICRAG also has various other projects with uh, mineral companies all around the world. Um, so we're always very, very interested in any company who wants to contact us with potential uh, research projects or questions they want answered. But I suppose in terms of our, I suppose our big, our two big projects at the moment are going to be Irish lead zinc and then the Central African copper belts and everything else is more minor than that. I could add to that that um, from a, a mineral exploration perspective, especially, uh, and and development of, of production in mines, um, there's a lot of areas across the world. That you you had that map in the in the beginning of the presentation. Um, there's about I say eight or nine locations, mainly dominated by sedimentary basins, which is where the large area of expertise yeah. lies in ICRAG, but also in, in other areas uh, such as porphyries, etc. Uh, maybe. Richard, if you want to uh, say something about whether this could be exported outside of Ireland, what you do? and Yeah, and I mean, a lot of the um, methodologies that we're trying to develop, um, as I say, could move into standards. They might start with Irish standards, but they may move into European and, and international standards. So especially like with potential work we're doing now, where we'd like to focus a bit more sometimes on how the Irish climate can affect certain build materials. But Similarly, you can then apply whatever methodologies we use to the specific climate of other regions as well. Um, so, yeah, the applicability is still there, but we just at the moment, we're trying to focus on products that we can use here sustainably. And then those methodologies can, can be used uh, globally. We do have connections uh, throughout Europe as well that, that, that we work with. Thank you. Thank you, Richard and Dave. Um... So, uh, it was a question I suppose I have for you is, is and I'll, I'll take another question from the audience um, after this, but, you know, one of the most astounding figures I saw recently is the amount of, of materials that we just need to produce over a short it's period of time um, to, to get, you. get this. So first, let me say and, yeah, so uh, produce it. Uh, and I was just wondering, is from your uh, preliminary research, maybe, is this something the, the Irish communities and people are aware of? I think it's increasing. I think it's there's an increasing awareness for a circular economy, the need to recycle, and not just to recycle paper, but also to recycle uh, these, these raw metals. But I still think there's, there's very often the impression that if we build more wind energy and we, we get more solar panels on our rooftops, then we are more sustainable um, as a society. And in principle, yes, if you look at the energy side of things, but very often people don't seem to realize that you need these raw metals to build, um, to build this 
this more sustainable energy system. Now, you can do that in a sustainable way. If you, if you mine in Europe, for example, it's well regulated. It's, it's pretty well controlled. But people don't realize that at the moment, often these metals come from China, or Africa, Latin America, where the circumstances are, are, are very different. So this is why we think you really have to look at these, these connections and do people connect the dots. And, and if they connect those dots, would they think mining in Europe or in, in Ireland is potentially more acceptable because you can control the circumstances here much better? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, I want to thank our panel, our, our speakers for their talks and the discussion. And I